Welcome to this episode of Disease Du Jour on the topic of the Equine Disease Communication Center Review of Diseases with Dr. Nat White. Dr. White was the driving force for the creation of the EDCC. A professor emeritus of equine surgery at the Marion DuPont Scott Equine Medical Center in Leesburg, Virginia, White and I will discuss the past two years of disease reports from the Equine Disease Communication Center. I'm your host, Kim Brown, publisher of Equine Management. As a little background on EDCC, it's an industry-driven initiative that works to protect horses and the horse industry from the threat of infectious diseases in North America. The EDCC is designed to seek and report real-time information about diseases, similar to how the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or the CDC, alerts the human population about diseases in people. The first priority of the EDCC is to protect and improve the health of horses in North America. Real-time information on infectious disease alerts, quarantines, and regulations are vital to helping horse owners keep their animals safe and healthy. Infectious disease alerts have profound and lasting effects on local economy and can result in millions of dollars lost due to horses being out, quarantines, canceled events, and then resources that are allocated to containing the outbreaks. There's also decreased horse movement in an area where there is an outbreak. The EDCC works to provide up-to-date, completely verified and easily accessible information that's easy to understand for equestrians in every facet of the industry. In this way, the EDCC helps to decrease the economic impact of an infectious disease on the $122 billion horse industry. The Disease Du Jour podcast is brought to you in 2021 by Merck Animal Health. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. White. Thanks, Kim. I appreciate being able to participate in your podcast today. Well, first, I just want to thank you for all the hard work and the blood, sweat, and tears you put in to getting the EDCC launched. I know this was a a project that you worked very hard on to get support and get it up and running, and it is very valuable to the industry. But can you tell us where do these disease reports come from? The reports are the basis for our information, and I think it's good to, to emphasize that the whole idea of this is to prevent disease spread and also to prevent rumors from spreading, which can shut down the industry. The reports come from state veterinarians as well as attending veterinarians. If the disease is reportable, the state veterinarian will send us an alert. They fill out a form on the website with the information we need, we take that and and make a uh, an alert, which goes out daily, or in some cases, as soon as we know there's an emergency. And you mentioned reportable diseases. So, what would some of those be, and why are some diseases reportable in some states and not in others? Each state makes up their mind about which diseases are reportable, and some of those are important to the horse industry, such as equine herpes, strangles, uh, other things like influenza, but not every state has the same list. And so we don't always get the information from a particular state if that disease is not reportable, and if a veterinarian attending the disease doesn't send it to us. So how can veterinarians get involved in reporting these confirmed diseases, even if they're not reportable in their state? Any veterinarian that has a disease that's confirmed by a test can go on to the website under the reporting of disease tab, and you can go there to fill out the form, which is online. Once you submit it, it will uh, go immediately to the EDCC and we'll also send you or send the veterinarian an email with a copy of the alert. And then we take that and make it into the information in our database where we store the information and then eventually we make monthly and annual reports uh, for the information. I think any veterinarian can go in and get the alerts. There's a way, a way on the website to sign in. It just takes your name and your email. And then when we send out alerts, everyone on that list gets the alert, which is basically a signal to go to the website for that particular alert or disease. 
And again, the veterinarians can receive those, but anyone can sign up for the alerts or go to the EDCC Facebook to be aware of those alerts from the EDCC, correct? Right. Owners, as well as veterinarians, or anybody that signs up for these alerts will receive them. And it's also posted on our mobile app. So if you have that on your phone, it gives you an up-to-date on the latest reserve and dessert, and it still has um, I'll step out. The mobile phone app has the latest alert and a list of the alerts that have happened. It, I will mention that it also has the information and in fact sheets for both veterinarians and owners. It's got biosecurity recommendations. All of this is downloadable or you can email it to your client. And that's why we think this is an important way to educate or yeah, and again, anyone can receive the alerts that go through the EDCC and are verified, but only veterinarians or state veterinarians can report a disease. So it's not a horse owner reporting it. It is a veterinarian who has confirmed it. That's correct. <laughs> it's important that we get the confirmed information that's accurate and reliable. And so uh, we always call if we need to to find out uh, the situation of the case and make sure it is accurate. And that's why this is so remarkable is that if it's a confirmed case, you know, as a veterinarian or a horse owner or an event supervisor or a stable or show facility owner, that this is information you can depend on. And again, you mentioned, and we'll talk about these in a little while, there are lots of resources on there for veterinarians to share with horse owners or for horse owners to have access to themselves. Yes, that's correct. We have almost all the AAP disease guidelines linked to the site. So you can go in and get that immediately. And it, it's become very important. Some of the big sh horse shows recently that had the herpes, we get calls trying to have people find out where the disease is and so on. I might say that when we get a report of, of a, a disease, a reportable disease, the state veterinarian can only locate that by county. And that's a liability issue. So uh, we can't <clears throat> expose the exact facility or town and so on, but at least um, <clears throat> the information is out there and people can seek uh, from other media where the <clears throat> disease may be located. I think one of the most important things about it is that with our alerts, we strive to show that the disease or that facility is quarantined. This gives a lot of relief to people to know that state veterinarians there, the attendant veterinarians taking care of it, and there's minimal risk of any spread of the disease. Right, and just to give a plug to Equa Management, we try to run all of these reports on our website and on our Facebook, and we try to put maps with them to give people a little uh, idea of where we're talking about. And again, this would be a county map, not a, this is where the facility is, unless it's a racetrack that has been named in the, in the alert. So let's go back, let's look at uh, 2020, and the EDCC puts out information and, you know, gives a great reporting of uh, the cases. And I uh, just want to look maybe at uh, some specific diseases and maybe some areas. And then also to let people know that on those reports that are put out by EDCC, you can see more uh, like a graph of a trend line. So you can see, okay, well, if the secular stomatitis is going to crop its head up again this year, which it doesn't every year, but the last two years we've had some pretty good cases, it seems to be seen in April and into May to start out. So it would be a good time to start looking for those clinical signs, those horses that may have it. Um, but we're going to sort of go through these alphabetically and talk about them a little bit. Uh, some of the diseases on the list are, are more foreign animal diseases, and we haven't seen cases of them, but it's good to keep an eye on them. Um, something like coronavirus, which in 2020, we did have a, a case in Arizona, one confirmed case. 
But then we get to diseases like equine and, uh, Eastern Equine Encephalitis, or EEE. We had 132 confirmed cases, confirmed cases. This is not suspect cases or you know, people not reporting, states not reporting. This was confirmed. And that was in 12 states and provinces. So having information like this, Dr. White, what does that help us, help veterinarians and horse owners to understand? Well, we hope that one, specifically with a disease like EEE, that <clears throat> people that know that it's in their state will take the advantage of getting the horses vaccinated. It's so important to know that that is in the mosquitoes in that region and it's infecting horses and that you can get a vaccination from your veterinarian to prevent it. Uh, we know that um, it's also a sentinel for human EEE. And so um, some of the states will use that once we report it to say they look for in mosquitoes, they look for the virus and maybe can help prevent diseases in humans. So that's, those are great points. And, you know, if, if historically you've had EEE in your state, and just to mention the 12 states in 2020 that had it, were Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Michigan, Minnesota, North Carolina, New Jersey, New York, Ontario, Canada, South Carolina, Virginia, and Wisconsin. Now, that doesn't mean that's the only states that can have EEE or that it will reoccur this year. But as Dr. White said, we know that mosquitoes in that population of horses have spread this disease in the past. Then you had uh, also um, on the list have herpes virus abortion, which in 2020 occurred in Ontario, Canada and South Dakota. And we know this can vary from year to year. Uh, what would you say about uh, the herpes virus? I know there's, we're gonna talk about abortion neurologic and respiratory herpes, but for the abortion, what do you say to vets and horse owners? Well, I think the important thing with that again is that the herpes virus is obviously in that horse and potentially any horses that are exposed to that horse. And so again, it's important to know that that's there. Um, the veterinarians will decide whether vaccination in that horse or group of horses is important in an attempt to try and prevent the abortion. So just knowing where it is, um, is important. And that's why we want to post it on our alerts. I think the neurologic herpes virus is one that most people pay attention to and it's much more prevalent. Uh, we just had in 2021, beginning of the year, we had 65 um, herpes virus reported and 42 of those were neurologic. And this is the time of year that they normally occur, and we've seen that in our uh, postings. And again, um, for the abortion and the respiratory forms, there are vaccines, and there is evidence that the vaccines can help um, in perhaps uh, the neurologic form, although there is not a vaccine license for the neurologic form, correct? That's correct. We know that horses that have been vaccinated can still get the neurologic form of the disease. And there's lots of questions about why that's the case. Uh, we know that these horses can exist with the virus. It can be latent in the horse. And then for some reason from stress or some other activity or another disease, it gets activated. And then in some of those cases, it ends up in the spinal cord and creates a actually a thrombosis in vessels and <clears throat> causes the signs we see with ataxia and so on. And we, again, neurologic herpes virus has been a, a big topic this year because of the outbreak in Europe. And we had a previous disease du jour podcast on herpes virus. So I don't want to over discuss it, but it's very important. I mean, um, as Dr. White said, there have already been reports this year, this year, of 65 cases of herpes and 42 of them neurologic in the United States, in North America. And in 2020, um, there were 16 states or provinces that had neurologic herpes virus reported. And in 2019, there were 25 states and provinces. So this is 
this is widespread. It can happen anywhere from Arizona to Wyoming and Texas to California. So this is not something that you should ignore, you should pay attention to. Yes, it's, it's important. And we think, and it's hard to tell, we think uh, that this might be increasing potentially um, in, in the United States and North America. The, <clears throat> there is a recent case, I think it was Pennsylvania, where the, there was a variant that has not been described. And I think they're working on that. But it's important to notice that this is can be a fatal disease, up to 30%. Horses that are neurologic and uh, <clears throat> have to be euthanized. And so it's, um, it's important to know that where it is and to try and keep up with it. Um, so <clears throat> it's one of the reasons, not all states, but most states have this as a reportable disease because it is potentially a problem for um, the industry. The recent um, cases in Florida at the showgrounds uh, with the panic that it caused really can be an economic problem, much less the welfare and health of the horses. And the next disease, equine infectious anemia, is one that we don't think about very much anymore. But it's something that this is what your Coggins test does for the horse owners. It lets you know if your horse has positive antibodies to this disease. But in 2021, there's been seven states and provinces with 45 confirmed cases this year. And in 2020, there were 17 states and provinces. So why, why are we seeing this disease so much more since we should be testing for it when horses are moved? Well, the United States has had a good program to test for movement interstate. And so that's been very good. But there are still pockets of this disease in the United States and in Canada. The other problem that recently that we recently found was the horses from Mexico that come in for the <clears throat> racing uh, illegally are carrying this. Now, potentially that and pyroplasmosis from mostly from dirty needles and exchange of blood in some fashion. So some of those horses have gone to other states in the United States, uh, of course, and that becomes a risk for horses that are exposed either by insects or again, uh, having <clears throat> blood transferred in some fashion. So it's not gone. And I think very important that we keep up our uh, surveillance to make sure that we get it under, keep it under control. I think that it is, but we still find pockets where it obviously has existed in some cases for years. And just as a, a word of advice, veterinarians have told me that if you want, if you rescue a horse, if you get something out of a kill pen, please make sure to use good biosecurity until your veterinarian can get that horse tested and checked to make sure that you're not exposing your horses and other people's horses. That's particularly true uh, <clears throat> for any of them, but particularly true for strangles, which seems to occur more frequently from that type of source. And <clears throat> again, has been spread to states from um, kill pens. And again, strangles is one of those that you see in just about any state or province easily spread um, so tell us a little bit about um, some of the cases of strangles that EDCC has tracked. Today's Disease to Shore podcast is brought to you by Merck Animal Health, the makers of prestige vaccines, Banamine, Panicure, Regimate, Protozil, and other trusted equine health solutions. Merck Animal Health works for you and for horses. Learn more about Merck Animal Health's comprehensive portfolio of products, as well as their ongoing investment in our industry, profession, and community at MerckAnimalHealthUSA.com. They show up, particularly Florida seems to be a hotbed of this. And I don't think we know other than the fact that it's transmissible by contact mostly, and that includes watering troughs, uh, other implements that have come up with the horse or by humans going from horse to horse. And so it's certainly in the population, 
although it's not as lethal as some of the other diseases, it can still be a problem. Then now we know that <clears throat> that strangles can be hiding in the guttural pouches for weeks or months. And so like <clears throat> herpes virus, it's there and how it gets out and becomes active again, it's not, not totally known. Yeah, I did see that uh, Dr. Noah Cohen uh, has a research grant to try and come up with a better blood test to uh, try and detect strangles. So we'll keep our fingers crossed that we uh, have maybe some better testing that we can uh, find these horses. But again, in, in 2021, I think you uh, had mentioned there's been 41 reports of strangles already this year. Yes, and I probably should note that when we started this, we didn't have veterinarians participating as much as they do now. So just because we've only we've had 40 some cases, that doesn't mean there are a lot more out there because in some states it's not reportable. And as of now, we don't have a lot of attending veterinarians submitting, and I'm hoping that we can get, convince people to do that because uh, it just helps to prevent the spread of these diseases. Yeah, it makes people more aware when you say, oh, okay, well, there's there's already strangles being reported in Florida. Maybe I should be a little more biosecure and a little more careful with what I'm doing. Yes, and particularly if you're traveling and they come in contact with other horses and at shows and so on, that's where it's spread. Right. And speaking of shows, we know that equine influenza is something that the uh, USEF and FEI both have regulations on vaccination for equine influenza, but we see equine influenza across North America. And what uh, what do you have to say about this disease? Again, it's not usually fatal, but it can shut down an operation uh, with fevers and so on. And of course, it's very transmissible by aerosol. And so it's there. It's it's out there. We get reports of it um, recently from Oregon, Rhode Island, Virginia, Washington. In fact, the Northwest seems to be a place where we see it commonly every year. So again, it's not, not as lethal, but horses get sick. It puts them out of commission for a while. And so it's good to know where it is so it doesn't spread. And again, because it's not a reportable disease in many states, it's it's really valuable if private practitioners who confirm that there are strangles, that can help other horse owners and veterinarians to, again, keep a better watch out for this and to warn their clients about moving horses and so forth. We encourage intending veterinarians that get a confirmed <coughs> disease, such as influenza, to enter that <coughs> in the database by going in and making out a report. Um, in some cases, veterinarians have sent us the information and also reported it to the state vet. And that's very helpful because we get the data that we need put in a database, such as the signalman and the condition of the horse. And then the state veterinarian, we always confirm it with them because it's their responsibility to make sure that everything's correct in their state. But it's very helpful to have the attending veterinarian for any disease to send it to us and we will report it. And a, a disease we don't think of quite as much is pigeon fever. And a lot of people think that's really just, you know, in, in one location. And I mean, what do you have to say about pigeon fever? Well, it was mostly in the Western states. California was one, some of those Southwestern states where it seems to be prevalent, but it's starting to creep across the Southern states. And we're also seeing in the Northwest, particularly this year, even in Canada. So it's it's something that we don't think about. <clears throat> it is a, a disease that can be devastating to the horse, depending on where it locates. And in some cases, if it's internal, it may not be very treatable. So <clears throat> it's always important to know uh, what to look for and to get it tested when you see these abscesses. And again, Potomac horse fever, which is another one that, you know, was named for the Potomac region. You think of it as a regional disease. But in 2020, it was in six states from Alberta, Georgia, Kentucky, Massachusetts, Tennessee, all the way out to Washington state. So it is not a regional disease anymore, is it? No, it's not. 
We used to think it wasn't in the West until John Madigan did a lot of his work, and we know now that it's everywhere. And again, that's something to just keep in as a differential diagnosis if you're looking at some of these horses. I guess one of my pet peeves as a horse owner is every year there's been at least one rabies case in horses reported. And this is a preventable disease. It's a disease that horses can get and spread to, to other horses and humans. So, I mean, why do we not see better vaccination protection for this disease, Dr. White? Well, one of the things that the EECC has exposed, and that's the lax vaccination for many of these diseases, EEE is one where we get horses reported and they've been unvaccinated. And so, uh, just like with rabies, it's out there. We don't think about it because it's rare, frankly, but um, it's still something that can be devastating and a huge risk for humans. So I think that um, hopefully as one of the things EDC can do is to, is to go ahead and emphasize the need for vaccination of these serious diseases. And veterinarians hopefully can <coughs> convince their <coughs> clients to do the same. Yeah, and for those who don't think that, that rabies is in the Western states, because I heard that when I moved from Kentucky to Wyoming, in 2021, rabies was confirmed in Colorado. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it, it can be anywhere that there's wildlife that can carry it. Um, when we're talking about some of these other diseases, um, Vesicular stomatitis, we had mentioned before, that's not something we see every year, and it is more of a geographic uh, disease, but we saw it spread quite a bit to different states in the last few years. What do you say about VS? Wherever, normally uh, it's considered to come from Mexico with the insect vector. And so depending on the environment, that insect vector can survive and it will spread wherever it goes. And so mostly it's in the western states and usually the southwest where we start seeing it first. And the EDCC doesn't count every case. Basically the USDA is involved with this disease and keeping track of it. So we count premises, assuming that if, if the horse is affected then others will probably be affected. And it's very strict quarantine for those facilities, again, controlled by the USDA. Our job is to report it so people know where it is. And one that uh, we have been dealing with in this, the United States, North America, for, oh gosh, it's been over a decade now, is West Nile virus. And again, it's one of those that can be anywhere. So what is your advice to veterinarians and horse owners about West Nile? <clears throat> we have a good vaccine for this. And even though recently we've seen less cases, and I'm not sure if that's because there's more vaccinated or if because it's not as virulent anymore, but it's, it can be a serious disease and it should be vaccinated for uh, because you can't, anywhere there's a vector, mosquito, so on, then they're at risk. Um, <clears throat> and I don't think we're going to wipe it out. And again, this is one of those that in 2020, it was in 12 different states from California, Colorado, Florida, Kentucky, Mississippi, Ontario, Utah, Virginia. I mean, it, was, it, it wasn't just located in one place. And uh, 2019, it was in 16 states and provinces. So, and not the same ones. And it's just something that, that has to be considered in your vaccination protocols, as Dr. White mentioned. And then um, when we talk about EDCC, this is the reporting, the disease alerts are really important. But as we mentioned before, there are fact sheets and biosecurity recommendations that are created for owners as well as links to the AAP guidelines. And they can all be viewed and downloaded from the website and the EDCC mobile phone app that you veterinarians can send on to owners. Why did you think that was so important to have available on the EDCC? The only way we're going to control and stop the spread of these diseases is if people are educated as to how that happens. 
and how <clears throat> they need to vaccinate their horses. And so one of our missions is to educate particularly the horse owner and hopefully aid the veterinarian in educating the horse owner by give, providing the information online uh, that can help explain the disease and help explain how to prevent it. Uh, <clears throat> to me, this is one of the most important things that we do is to try and educate people about the disease, how it spread, how you can prevent it. And uh, so biosecurity is huge for us. And uh, we keep all these things up to date. The AAP Infectious Disease Committee helps us review the fact sheets to make sure they're accurate. And those are reviewed by AAP every three years. And so, or if there's immediate change. So <clears throat> we think, well, I'm hoping that veterinarians will utilize this and have them have the fact sheets distributed to their clients when they're faced with the disease. And is there anything else, Dr. White, that you would like to say specifically to veterinarians listening to this podcast about the EDCC? Well, I've always wanted it to be a universal source for where you go to get disease information and current activity of the disease on the alerts. It's important to remember that this is totally funded by the horse industry. And that includes owners, veterinarians, practices, um, horse organizations and associations, as well as companies. And it won't exist unless that happens and continues to have good support. So we urge veterinarians to help, either by donating or by having their clients understand how important it is and also they can donate. And the website and app both make it very easy. There is a support tab on the toolbar that you can click on and learn how that you can make donations to the EDCC to keep this very credible information out there that does help horse owners as well as veterinarians um, understand the diseases that are pertinent now. It's, it's important to know that the, the funding for this goes into AEP's foundation, the foundation for the horse, and there's an EDC fund there, and all donations are tax deductible. That's a great point. So you can make a donation right through the EDCC website. You can send a donation to the AAEP foundation marked for the EDCC, and that's a good point that this is a, a great um, charity to support, if you will, that will help you in the long run. Is there anything else we need to cover today, Dr. White? No, I think you've done a great job. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you again for being the, the brains and the brawn that brought this about that's done such good for the industry. And we want to thank our listeners to, um, for joining us today. And again, remember that EDCC is industry-funded nonprofit. So if you can help support this group, that would be wonderful. Thank you for listening to Disease Du Jour and a special thanks to our 2021 sponsor, Merck Animal Health. You can listen to previous episodes of Disease Du Jour on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher or your favorite podcast platform. And if you have any questions or suggestions, send an email to me at kbrown at equinenetwork.com. Disease Du Jour is a production of the Equine Podcast Network, an entity of the Equine Network, LLC.